I just wanted to thank John and Steve for having me up here. It's a great privilege to be up here. And you know, it's really good to see a full, full house here. Can't really see the back. But, um, so like he said, my name is Garish. I work in the London uh, engineering team, actually. We just opened a new office in uh, London. And uh, I work on the internal tools, if you can't tell. We have a London street sign logo. That's going to be our unofficial logo. It says London you know, internal tools software engineer. Uh, Anyway, uh, so, I'm, you know, I'm, and I'm going to be talking about a topic that's pretty near and dear to me because I've worked on it for most of my life at Facebook. So, uh, so you, we have these posters all over our offices. And how many ops people are out there? Yeah, good amount. It's like about half. So if you see this poster, like the ops person in me, I've done ops all, most of my career. I see move fast and break things, and those are the two things that ops people don't want. They want to move slow and not break things, right? And uh, the, this is our, almost our unofficial motto at Facebook, right? We, we like people moving fast and breaking things. But what, you know, if you kind of read between the lines, what I think it means is, you know, move fast and don't be afraid to make, break things. Uh, don't be afraid to take risks. And the don't be afraid is kind of in between that line there. And uh, you can't really see it because it didn't really fit on the poster, but it's there. <laughs> and it, it's, it's the core of Facebook. We, we like to take risks. We like everything we do is kind of, you know, it pushes you forward. We try to get you innovate more. And that's kind of from there, I took that and I, you know, I worked on deployment tools at Facebook for a long time. And I you know, twisted the poster a little bit, and I made it move fast and ship things. Because uh, if you're moving fast and you know, making changes all the time, you have to ship them. All right, so let's get started. Um, this is a graph of all of the commits to our web repository uh, at Facebook by month. So uh, that's the monthly number of commits going to our web repository. This is our main repository. It's most of the engineers are on this repository. And if you look, most recently I took it September 28th, which was a few days ago. Um, so it's not all of September, so it probably is still up there. Uh, it's about 20,000 a month. That's close to four to 5,000 a week that you know, engineers are committing changes to our repository. That's a lot of commits. Um, and if that number doesn't astound you, hopefully this number does. It's 50, you know, 552 million daily active users over average um, of June. This is the number off our main public website, so it's not, not, you know, not a big secret. But these are the number of users that are logging onto Facebook every day. And what we do is we change the site out from under them every day. And in fact, we do it multiple times a day. Uh, and soon to be regularly twice a day, uh, because we have offices in uh, New York, we have offices in London, and these engineers can't really stay up till midnight for the, you know, the daily push that goes on during the evening in California. So we're going to be doing a morning push and an evening push as well. And you know, it's, it's crazy to see full traffic going to your website and us changing out all the code that runs underneath it. Um, you know, it used to be pretty easy, right? It, we used to be a PHP shop, and we still are a PHP shop, but I'll get to that. Um, we used to be a pure PHP shop running on Apache, and we had about, you know, when you change the line of code, you would just rsync that file across, and that would be it. You know, like rsync it to a couple thousand servers, you're done. And when I joined Facebook, that's what we did. Um, and then they put me in charge, and I haven't brought Facebook down too many times, but they put me in charge of, you know, doing all the deployment tools at Facebook. And they said, you need to maintain. It takes an hour to do our current deployment. You need to maintain this as we scale up. And I've been at Facebook since early 2008, so it was about 80 million users. And now, you know, 955. Uh, it's getting there. Uh, and it's, um, it's been quite a ride. And you know, the things used to be very simple. We used to just rsync servers, and uh, rsync PHP files, and it used to be done. But then, about two years ago, we decided to throw a big wrench in my workload, which was we changed everything to hip hop. And with hip hop, what happens is 
uh, it has to be one big giant binary. And it's about a 1.2 gigabyte binary that we create every time we compile our code. So what HipHop does, for those who don't know, is convert PHP files to C++ files, and then it compiles and links them all together, and it creates this big tarball, and we ship that. And we ship that to a lot more servers than, I, than we do when, we, when I started out. And of course, we ship every day, and we ship just as fast. Uh, we actually cut down on time now. So let's see how we do that, right? So this, you know, this process is pretty simple. You check out the code that's currently in our production branch. You kind of build your static resources, your JavaScript, your CSS, your images, and everything. You package them up separately. HipHop does all of this for you. Uh, then it translates the PHP files to C++, and then it sends it out to a cluster of machines that compile our code. So it's a just a C cluster. It's about 200, 300 machines, I think. And <clears throat> we, um, we take all the C++ files and just ship them out, and we get the .o object files back. Uh, and then we package them together, put them in a tarball, ship them to all the different machines, restart the server with the new binary, and you're done. Simple, right? Um, let's see how fast it really is, right? So. Uh, the compile step is our slowest step. It takes about 21 minutes to do the entire compile uh, with the help of these machines. It would take hours otherwise. And uh, if I break down that compile step, it's actually doing uh, the actual compile and linking is actually only about half that time, right? It's about 10, 11 minutes. And then it spends 30% of the time doing um, creating the, the C++ files from your PHP files. And then 14% uh, of the time, it does optimizations. And that's how long it takes to compile our, our website every day. Um, ah, and the deploy. Um, so w w when they came to me and they said, you have to maintain this like one hour deploy, our syncing 1.2 gigabyte binary to 10,000 machines is a pain in the ass. Um, you just can't do it fast enough. So. As a hackathon project, I sat down with one of my teammates and decided uh, that BitTorrent was a great idea. I know they discourage it here, but we use it in our production environment. And it's actually really good. Uh, for example, I have, this, I have this example that I did when I did my first test run of the setup. I shipped a 500 megabyte server, a file to 10,000 servers. And it took 58 seconds. And you know, the prompt came back, it's like done. And I kind of looked at it twice. Didn't believe it. Uh, then I ran another you know, distributed uh, shell command to get the MD5 sums of every single file that had shipped to make sure that they actually ended up in whole on the other side. And sure enough, it was there. So 58 seconds. So you would think, you know, 10,000 machines, 58 seconds, you know, a couple, uh, you know, couple of 10,000 machines, it should be a couple minutes, right? Um, but the, unfortunately, there's a, another bottleneck. We have to restart every server. So we, we run our servers fairly high, so we don't run them at you know, half the capacity or anything, so we can't really bring up the second instance on the same server. So what we actually do is take the server out of the load balancer, um, let it drain traffic, restart the box, make sure it comes up, sanity check it, and then we put it back into the load balancer, and then we let it go. So the whole trip for each server takes about two minutes. So this is a huge bottleneck. And if anyone has better ideas, let me know. Um, I'd love to hear it. So how long does it take to actually change Facebook.com? So we have three phases, right? The first phase is six hosts. This is our canary build. And this is where the compile is actually done. So we take the compile, uh, the compiled binary, we send it to the six hosts that are behind a real load balancer uh, that mimic prod for all necessary purposes, and then engineers you know, test it on those machines. And we have logging, monitoring uh, up to the wazoo on these machines. And then we, if once we're satisfied, we go to 2% of our machines. And once we're satisfied there, we go to 100% of our machines. And if you notice, OK, so if you take out the compile step, uh, it's about 15 minutes to do six hosts. Then it drops down to 13 minutes to do 2% of our hosts, which is a lot more than six. Um, and then it, drop, you know, then it goes up to 45 minutes uh, for 
all of our hosts. And the reason for 45 minutes is because on the, on the phase two, we can go at 100% concurrency, but at phase three, we can usually only do about 25 to 35% of our concurrency because of the traffic that's coming in. We can't really shut down Facebook.com because if you do 100%, it would shut it down. All right, so that's how we change Facebook.com. But if you, know, if you notice, we do change it far more often than that, right? There's way, way more changes that are going on. They're user-driven changes. And I wanted to talk to you about those as well because that, I think, is pretty important. Um, and, you know, so we have, we have you know, in-memory uh, configuration changes that we change all the time. Um, these are, you know, usually stored in memcache or on the web server itself. Uh, we have things like uh, back-end services, like, for example, your newsfeed is actually generated on a service that's behind the scenes, not driven by the web server. And we change those, and this is kind of cheating because, you know, we can swap them out without, without anyone knowing about it. And then um, the back-end services uh, do affect how your newsfeed is rendered. And the last part that I really, you know, I think is pretty great to Facebook and how we use it is called Gatekeeper. It's a simple application level gate. Uh, and, you know, I can walk you through how it works. So, so we, ha you know, we have all those libraries for Gatekeeper, but at the simplest form, it's pretty much this. It's um, your project name, so let's say timeline, and the user that's you're acting on that you're trying to restrict or allow, and then you say gatekeeper allowed, and you send those two in, and then it either runs the code inside the if or inside the else, right? And it's as simple as it gets. But we use this liberally everywhere, and we use this for all our product rollouts. We use this for um, restricting geographically. So, you know, some things are blocked in Pakistan, for example, uh, because of content. Uh, we use this. Um, and we also use this for testing internally. Anyway, I wanted to share what the UI would look like for this. And this is a real screenshot of a project that I just randomly pulled out. It's, I can't really name the project, but this is what it is. And this is what it kind of looks like. And um, that's my UID in the corner over there in the red. It's failing. I, I don't pass this, this gatekeeper check, so I don't have this feature enabled on my Facebook. But if you notice, only 1% of the US population has this enabled, and 5% of the Great Britain population. But 100% of the Korean population has this enabled. So we have very granular control over how we gate features and projects. Um, so this is just one project. And the project is kind of a misnomer because, like, Timeline or Newsfeed had hundreds of gatekeepers associated with it. And I actually have a screenshot of a dependency chain of gatekeepers. This is just part of it. Um, it's amazingly crazy. And if you zoom in a little bit, that's the feed launch. And there's all these dependencies on feed launch from other gatekeepers. And you can see you know, ticker tests and feed delay and all of these other things. I actually don't know what those mean because I don't work on product. But uh, it, it, it amazed me how many, kind of scared me too, but how many controls we had for uh, these dependency chain. And Gatekeeper is actually infamous for this article. Um, so what we had was we had an internal joke where one of our engineers developed fax a photo and he just signed up for eFax account and he actually got it working as a hackathon project. And it was enabled for all Facebook employees for a long time. And then the PR team got, you know, kind of annoyed at TechCrunch for just writing articles about every little feature we changed on Facebook. So they opened this Fax Your Photo feature just to the TechCrunch network. <laughs> and sure enough, 30 minutes later, there's an article on TechCrunch that says, Facebook lets you fax your photos. We have no idea why. It sounds like a stupid idea, but yeah. And then all the comments, if you look at this article, you can search for this article. If you look at if you look at the comments, they're all, I don't see this. What are you guys, you know, like, what are you guys talking about? There's no fact sheet photo. Are you guys, you know, is this April Fool's? Uh, but it was in September. So, 
And then you know, they called us up, and our PR guys picked up the phone and just couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> so this is, this is kind of, uh, and they, they acknowledged that we punked them. It's kind of fun to have. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of how we change Facebook.com every day. And we, you know, like people say, we have Facebook, um, a brand new Facebook underneath the, the shell. And we use it to do load balancing. We use it to do load testing. For example, when Timeline rolled out, we didn't know what kind of load it could handle. So we actually had a dark launch where you were um, enabled for the back-end calls to get the data from Timeline. So every time you looked at a profile of a normal, like just a non-Timeline user, we would actually do the, the fetch to do the Timeline call and to see how it would affect our, our servers, um, how, how load tested they are. And the best way to do load test at our scale is to actually send it out to real users. And then we never showed uh, sh you know, like actually revealed information, we just kind of threw it away. And we did both data fetches and we kind of just picked one. And um, that's how we load test this timeline. So it's, it's actually a very useful tool. All right, so where do we go from here, right? Um, I've, I've seen this company scale from about 80 engineers to over 1,000 engineers. Uh, I want to know how this process will scale to 10,000 engineers. I'm not saying we'll get there tomorrow, but you know, we have to think about it. And we are going at a pretty rapid clip. And you know, it's, it's interesting to me on how these um, processes work. Because I work um, for developer tools. I, I, I write tools for developers. And um, we have open sourced a lot of our tools and things like that. But you know, we have a lot of challenges still to solve there. And the biggest thing that's more current right now is this mobile world, right? Um, we can't really do daily pushes to your smartphones. The data would just kill you, right? I mean, it's just annoying. People won't upgrade um, and things like that. So we have to rely on the you know, iTunes Store or the Google Play to do timely releases. So we're down to a monthly or bi-monthly or whatever cycle, right? And it doesn't really work uh, with our, our way of thinking. And uh, there, is, there was a push a couple, you know, I guess two years ago, where we decided HTML5 was a good, good place to do this. And that was the reason why, because we couldn't do the daily pushes. We knew we had this web infrastructure. Why not we create a shell, a native shell, and then have HTML5 do all the content for us? Didn't quite work out as well as we thought it would. Um, actually, one of my colleagues, Jackson, is going to be talking about exactly that later on today in one of the tracks. So you should definitely go check it out if you're interested in that. And he talks about why we go from native to HTML5 back to native. And it's fascinating stuff. Anyway, uh, that's all I had for you guys tonight, today. Uh, thank you. Uh, and come see me if you have any questions. <laughs>